So very quickly, setting the stage for why this conversation is so important. Our industry is more complex and competitive than ever before. If you work in marketing higher ed, you already know that, right? Our market is in decline. Enrollment is down year over year, anywhere from 1% to 1.5% for the past five years. So that means demand is down at the same time that we all know that supply is not just up, but it's way up. Because high school graduation rates are declining, they won't be back to the 2012 level until mid-2020s, which means less students are graduating high school, less students are going to college, less students want to go to college, more institutions are therefore cash-strapped at the traditional student level, and they're shifting to the adult and online space to try to open up a new revenue stream. So they're trying to find out how can they compensate for declining margins and profits on the campus offerings by going online, which means we have a, a real decrease in demand and a huge increase in supply, which makes it a mature and saturated market. Uh, couple that with the fact that unemployment rate is at an all-time low, which is great. I'm definitely not saying it shouldn't be, um, but we all know that the reality is our industry is counter-cyclical. So as the economy gets better, less and less people go back to school, especially at the graduate level for those career advancers. Uh, so the reality is it's a tough spot to be, and it's a tough spot for just about all of us. 70% of schools are saying that U.S. applications are down, and it's important to note that you know, many of us might be from small to mid-sized nonprofits, but it's not just us that are suffering. We're suffering from a true enrollment perspective, so from a revenue perspective, but the elites are suffering as well. When you look at the top seven business schools in the country, we find a really interesting trend that they don't like to tell you, which is they're not nearly as selective as they used to be. So the, <laughs> the reality is 20, the class of 2020 and the class of 2019 for the top seven schools, they all accepted the same number of students as they previously did, but they're down in total applications up to 8% which means even these so-called elites that are selective are a whole lot less selective than they were just three or four years ago. So the hurt is coming for them too. Unfortunately for us, we're just stuck in the middle and we're getting squeezed and we're feeling it first. Um, so this is a whole lot happening in the market uh, and it's a difficult and challenging place to be, which is what's leading to those closures. Hopefully none of us are facing that, but we know in our spaces we're seeing anywhere from 12 to 24 a year. And so we're seeing that consolidation, that closure and that pressure. And for us in marketing, we're all being asked to do more with less, right? I don't know about you guys, in my budget process this year, it was like, how can you make us more money next year with less money? And I was like, well, if I could have figured that out, I would have done it this year, because that would have been a great win. <laughs> um, but you know, great suggestion, Boston God, I never thought of that. Uh, and so I was like, well, what if we did more with less? Brilliant idea. And so this is really what we're facing. Uh, the reality is, and I hate to say it, but I kind of secretly love to say it, if you're a marketer in higher ed, this is the best day you're gonna have for the next 10 years. So enjoy it, because it only gets worse from here. <laughs> Which is why today's conversation is so critical. Uh, because we talk about increasing conversion rate. Increasing conversion is about increasing ROI. Likely, your marketing budget next year is fixed. So you only have a certain amount of money that you're gonna get. But the return on that investment is variable. What you do with that money can deliver a different result coming back into you. So what can you do to increase that? This is the stuff that I love to talk about because it's very hard to increase that fixed number, that budget number, but every little thing that we can do, battle of inches and in how to get your email open rates up to 40%, get your form fills up to four or 5% per page, double conversion rate on your website, all those things I'm gonna give to you today, those are the kind of things that can make a year without having to change your budget. So to do that, we have to start with why we buy. So why we buy is one of my favorite things to think about and talk about. Uh, I'm a really, really big fan of, of neuroscience, as I mentioned, and the psychology of sales. So the first question that we have to ask ourselves as marketers is what do prospective students want? And we've been trained, going to a lot of great conferences, that, that we know the answer to this, right? That we know that prospective students want, they want to start a new career, they want to change careers, maybe they want to advance their current career, they want professional satisfaction, some of them want personal satisfaction. But we know that about 70 to 75% of adult prospective students want some form of advanced career attainment, whether it's their career starters, career changers, or career advancers. And so it's different for folks based on the stage of their life. Undergraduate students are typically career changers or career starters, and graduates typically career advancers, but that's not always the case. But we know that what they want is career outcome. Except what if that's not what they really want? So I challenge and I pose to the group a rather controversial opinion, which is to ask the question, what do prospective students really want? So I'm gonna go ahead and like channel my inner Olivia Pope. What do you want? Any scandal fans out there? And then we have to ask ourselves, what do prospective students really want? And the question is, what if the ultimate outcome prospective students want isn't the degree and isn't even the career? Okay, I want the degree. Okay, why do you want the degree? Because I wanna get a better job. Why do you wanna get a better job? So I can make more money. Why do you wanna make more money? If we push this, we find ourselves at Maslow's hierarchy of human needs. What people really want is success, satisfaction, safety, 
pride, admiration, recognition, acceptance, celebration, and to belong. These are basic human needs. Now, people and prospective students have put in their minds that an advanced career or getting a new job or more money is going to get them this, but this is what they want to buy. They don't want the degree, right? We always say they don't want the degree, they want the career. But they don't actually want the career. They want to feel satisfied. They want to make more money so they go home, they have the admiration of their spouse or their children. Or they have the safety and security of knowing they're in a better situation. Or the flexibility, the sense that they can belong to things outside of their career. They can coach their son's little league because they can get off of work on time. People want some basic human needs. And it's really important because John O'Shaughnessy, who's like the best author on this stuff ever, he wrote this book, Why People Buy. Uh, it's so fantastic. Uh, it came out in 1988. You can like only find it on eBay, but super worth it. Uh, he writes, effective advertising must always offer, however obliquely, the possibility of enhancing the target audience's chances of achieving life goals. And what he talks about in this book is that at the end of the day, all we ever are selling is improved quality of life. And every single purchase decision we ever make is in some form or function connecting us to improved quality of life within our subconscious. And he talks about that that is ultimately what we're selling. And so for the average adult prospective student, I believe that they're looking for permission to believe. And in particular at the undergraduate level, where the vast majority of students are transferring in credits, which means unfortunately that they have failed previously, people are looking for the opportunity to believe that this is an investment that they should make. An investment that they should make in themselves, that they should make with us as our institutions as a proper partner, and that it will ultimately return. This is one of the largest purchase decisions of their entire lives. Outside of buying a house, it's the most expensive thing they will ever buy. And the guarantee of getting it is a whole lot less than getting the house when you pay for it. And so this is a high, high risk purchase choice. It's highly emotional and they're looking for belief and believability. And so for that reason, it's important to know that we are in the belief business. That is what we sell. So what do we really sell? We sell opportunity, possibility, probability, permission, and a plan. Now don't get me wrong, we still sell degrees and we still sell career advancement, but we absolutely cannot lose sight of the fact that intrinsically, subconsciously, and irrationally, this is exactly what people are evaluating us against. How likely are you to provide me an opportunity that is highly probable and you're giving me the chance to believe in myself and a plan that I can actually believe in? Ultimately, this is what we are really truly selling in our space. So that gets me to the meat and potatoes of the conversation today, which is, okay, that's great, you guys have entertained me with my little philosophical rants, uh, but how do we buy, and can I actually give you all some tips on how to increase this? But I shared that first part because I truly believe in the, that there are lessons in the tips that I'm gonna share today that are deeply psychological about how people make purchase decisions. So I don't just wanna tell you that you need to put your first name in every email subject line every time, no exceptions ever ever always put the first name in every time, and I'm gonna tell you that, and it sucks, and I hated it, but it works. But I want you to think about why, and why would that always work, and why, why, why? Because the more we understand the why, the faster we can scale these opportunities. So how do we actually decide to buy things? The first thing is that before we decide what to buy, we have to decide to buy. And that's a little wordy, but basically, before we actually make a purchase choice of like what we're gonna drink, we have to decide that we wanna go get a drink. We have to decide that we're thirsty. Like first comes a need, before there comes a choice. Second is we have to realize that the decision is rarely a rational one. Almost every purchase decision and every chance in life is emotional. This thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollar purchase is totally emotional. And you know why I know it's emotional? Because there's 850 online MBAs and not one person is ever price compared. So they can tell you all they want they do, but as we see in the last bullet, why people buy and why they say they buy aren't the same thing. When we ask someone why they buy, they tell us whatever they think will make them look smarter to us. But the reality is, they don't want to say, well, it's highly irrational, I was sitting on the couch, I thought about it, I went online, I saw a nice picture, I filled out a form, they called me, the guy was nice, I don't know, I was in class two weeks later. <laughs> no one wants to tell us that, but that's the truth, right? And so what we need to realize is that that moment when things happen is a moment of inspiration, and it's not entirely rational, and that's also totally okay. So, the key for us in marketing is to take all the things that we do and divide them into two buckets. All of marketing is either reacting to action, or it is inspiring action. I'm gonna break those two buckets down because that to me is one of the most important ways to look at the psychology of sales in the adult and online higher education space. So reacting to action means that it's in response to consumer behavior. The consumer makes a decision, they've already decided to buy, and they're in the act of consideration or evaluation, and they've made that choice and we are inserting ourselves. So it requires an organization to listen and deploy our marketing as a result. This is paid search, right? Someone goes online, they type online MBA into search. They've already decided to buy. They're already in the evaluation stage. So we have to listen, which is Google, and we have to insert our ad in front of them and attempt to interrupt their purchasing process to ensure that they consider us for evaluation. 
These typically utilize highly competitive bidding platforms. That's why paid search is so incredibly expensive. And it also, the benefit to us as marketers is often this is direct attribution. So we can see if someone clicks the link and if they actually convert. It's at least more direct than what I'm about to talk about. So this is reacting to action. This is where most of us focus a lot of our time. I'm gonna share some tips in a minute, but I'm gonna tell you that the real secret sauce, hopefully for today, is talking about inspiring action. So the second stage is, okay, inspiring action is upper funnel marketing execution. This is an interruption tactic. This is like a consumer is doing something else with their day, and we're totally jumping in front of them like the sign spinners trying to get you to go to Subway for a sandwich, and we're like, hold on a second, consider going back to college and making a $50,000 purchase today. And that's what we do. It's very difficult to measure, and it's often indirect attribution, but this is inspiring action and there's some art behind this. This is your upper funnel TV, your paid social, and a lot of your other really kind of at a home, radio, television, OTT kind of interesting stuff that you can do. Okay, so how do we react to action? I'm gonna give you five tips here. I really believe if you have good partners, they're already doing the majority of the things that I'll share with you, and a lot of folks already know a ton of this stuff. So I don't wanna spend a ton of my time today on this, but I'm gonna give you some gold on how do we react to action in a way that increases conversion and why. So the first one is you wanna improve your speed to lead with advanced day parting. So I think probably everyone in this room is familiar with what speed to lead is, which is the concept of how fast you get in touch with an inquiry from the point that they inquire. So industry best practice is five minutes. So five minutes from the point of inquiry, your phone rings. Uh, there are some folks in our space that have brought that down into under a minute pretty consistently, which is terrifying because I sure as hell can't figure out how to get the tech to do that, and I wish they would tell me. But here's the tip. It's really simple. The vast majority of folks that I talk to pay the same amount for an inquiry on a Friday at 6 p.m. as they do for an inquiry Monday morning at 9 a.m but you know that the inquiry Monday morning at 9 a.m. is gonna get called right away, because most, most enrollment shops do a last in, first out strategy, and you know that Friday inquiry is not gonna get called till afternoon on Monday, because the last in, first out strategy means that those inquiries that came in Friday can't get called until the sun, Saturday, Sunday, and Monday morning inquiries get worked first. So why are we paying the same amount per inquiry? And the reason is that most part people do a flighting bidding strategy, which means they just say, oh, we'll turn paid search off on the weekend because we're closed, so we'll turn it up. What we actually need to do is an adjusted cap strategy, which means you want to pay a different amount for the inquiry that comes. You still want that inquiry Friday night, right? They're still a person. They're still going to go back to school, but you don't want to pay the same amount because you know you can't convert them at the same rate, so their lifetime value won't be the same. So it's a super simple thing to do uh, is a day parting cap strategy on Google. It's actually not that difficult to execute, but I highly recommend that you think about it and you ask questions about it because why would you pay the same amount for an inquiry on a Friday night as you would on a Monday morning when you know fundamentally they won't convert the same? The second one, this is the easiest freebie. Every word in your paid search ads should be capitalized. It increases your click-through rate by 10%. That's right, you don't even change the copy, you just capitalize every word. You look like you're shouting at people and for whatever reason, they secretly love it. And they click on it. So 10% increase in your click-through rate within 60 days if you capitalize the first letter of every word. Uh, the third is that you should test your value proposition wording against search behavior. And what I mean by that is you shouldn't rely on your clients, yourselves, or your administration to tell you what your value propositions are. You should let the market decide. So take your branded paid search strategies, which is when someone types in your institution's name, and hopefully like online programs or some indicator that they're really interested, and then you test all the value props you can think of to figure out which ones work, and you test all the wording of it. So like, even though I've come from running a creative agency, I'm really not interested in a copywriter telling me what my value props are. I want the market to tell me what they care about. And so one of the things that we learned, excuse me, at National University is that everybody loves our four-week class format. The reason is because you, you get the impression that you can finish faster, and everybody wants to finish faster because everybody wants to get it done. But we found out was that the market doesn't actually like the language four-week classes. They like the language one-month classes. And I can't tell you for the life of me why. The only thing I can think of is that one month is like easy to manage in my head because it's like I know what I'm doing in July, and I know what I'm doing in August, and so it feels like easy to manage. I don't know why, that's my thought on it, but either way, one month classes performs better than four week classes, and the only way we knew that is we put all the different types, four week classes, 28 day classes, one month classes, we put all of it into market, and let the market tell us which ones resonated the best. The third one, or fourth one is responsive search ads from Google, just came out like what, a little over a year ago. Uh, if you, responsive search ads basically means that you put in all sorts of headlines, and then you put like 15 variations of body copy, and then based on what people search, Google just spins out anywhere from like 10,000 variations of your ads with all your different value propositions. We saw a 27% increase in click-through rate within 30 days of launching that. And all we did was just like let the machine do its thing. It's kind of terrifying to like let the machine go, but it totally works. So uh, if you're not doing RSAs, you should totally do it. Uh, and then finally, I just want to leave with the biggest caveat of this section, which is that you need to effectively measure past leads to lower funnel value. Like ultimately what we're trying to do is drive starts. And we're trying to drive successful starts. People that are going to benefit from the program, they're going to finish the program, they're going to be better off, and they're going to actually pay back their loans and not default. 
Like we're trying to do a win-win kind of thing here. And so if you measure this stuff just on leads, you're gonna become a lead shop, and all you're gonna find is cheap leads, and cheap leads don't convert. And it's a really scary position to be in, and I've found myself in that position many times, so please learn from my suffering, and uh, make sure that you're measuring by multiple points throughout the funnel. My recommendation uh, is that you measure it by inquiry, lead, Lead is single person, prospect is how we call it, so like that one person is a lead, but they can inquire multiple times. You can call it whatever you want. Uh, the third step to me is transfer, which means they make it through a prequal of some kind, they pick up the phone, uh, and then you go through to application submitted, which means they did their homework, they filled out the app, and then admitted, admit, you know, admitted, admission, start, whatever you want to call it that they show up. Uh, but, but measuring those across each of those steps is super critical in this process. And so those are a few tips for reacting to action. Uh, I encourage you to bring them up, to try them out with your team. Uh, they've been really great things that have worked for us in the past 12 months. But what I'd love to do is talk about how do we inspire action, because this is the big, crazy stuff that I really, truly believe we have to be able to master in order to break out. Because the truth is, we're in a really saturated, mature market. There's 4,000 colleges and universities that have financial aid, 7,000 total in this country, and the only way you get to grow is by taking market share from your competitors, because that's how it works in a mature market. There's no new customers coming in for growth, so the only way you win is by someone else losing. That is the sad reality. So it means we have to outsmart the people next to us, and we have to crush, and we have to go enroll students. So how do you do that? One of the ways is you inspire action, which means you don't just sit and react and respond to Google or to Bing, but you have to actually get out and generate interest and buzz for your brand. And you have to do it in a way where you can stand out uniquely. So the first thing to understand is that our first competition is noise. Absolutely, this is the first competition. It's not somebody else. It's not anybody else. It's entirely noise. People see 4,000 ads per day. Facebook users scroll 300 feet of newsfeed every day, which I want to say is crazy and talk down on them, but that's totally me, so I really don't want to do that. <laughs> I think it's a very reasonable amount. And 45% of people, like me, if they ever actually watch television, do so with a second screen, so a phone or a tablet. So like, let's be clear here, there's like a lot of noise happening, and nobody wants to hear anything we have to say. Like, nobody cares at all about what we're doing. So that's the first thing that we're up against. <laughs> So the thing we need to do is understand a few key concepts. So I'm gonna explain three key concepts and I'm gonna show you how they work in execution. So the first one is a psychological concept called the elephant and the rider. Has anybody heard of this concept before? Oh my gosh, if you take nothing else away, this is like my favorite thing I ever learned as a marketer. So it came from an NYU psychologist. And the idea was that there's two segments to the brain. There's a great book called Thinking Fast and Slow, and it talks about segment one and segment two brain. And segment one brain is like this irrational, bumbling, kind of just like walking through life, animalistic brain that doesn't think about anything, is totally impulsive. And that drives most of our life. And then the segment two brain is just like really rational, executive function side of our brain that tries to be logical about everything. And so this NYU psychologist came up with this concept that totally illustrates it perfectly, which is that inside our brains is an elephant and a rider. And that rational side of your brains that you're thinking about, that's the rider. But the truth is that the elephant is in charge. And so when, if you're riding an elephant and an elephant turns its head because it sees something interesting, the rider has to shift their perspective. And the rider thinks they're in charge, but they're just following whatever the elephant's telling them to do. This is how we actually think psychologically and make the majority of our decisions. So when we talk about breaking through the noise, we are marketing to the elephant on Facebook and on television. And when you click to go to the landing page of the website, now we're marketing to the rider, because the rider's trying to figure out why the hell am I on this page right now? <laughs> I was just watching Gilmore Girls, and suddenly all, I'm, I'm going back to college, and, I've, and so it's like, now we gotta pay off for the rider. And I'm gonna tell you exactly how to do that, and why this like so seriously works, it's crazy. The second thing is you have to perfect priming. So priming is the concept of preparing someone's mind subconsciously for a future conversation. So there's a couple crazy ways to do this. Uh, no lie, they did a study where people were given warm coffee, and other people were given cold coffee, and then people came up and had an interaction with them, and people that were holding a warm cup of coffee rated their positive sentiment to the person they talked to 50% higher just because of the temperature of the coffee in their hands. Nothing else changed. And so holding a warm beverage dramatically increased your likelihood to like the person you were talking with. The other one was if you wanted to get a good deal on buying a car, next time you go to buy a car, you'll find out that when you get to that finance room, the one where they like kind of screw you over right before you get out the door with that great deal you thought you negotiated, the chairs are super comfortable. Because if it's really plush and comfortable seats, you're more willing to let things slide and not negotiate. But if you sit in a really hard or uncomfortable seat, you're more willing to be diligent and focusing on your own personal demands. This shit's crazy, but totally real. <laughs> So I took this like way too far. This is actually the office we have in San Diego, and I put a giant 10-foot tall word yes right next to where we pitch to all of our clients. 
Now, mind you, they did figure it out. They were like, what's with the giant yes? And I was like, I didn't even notice that. <laughs> but the idea was, you know, over time, maybe they'll forget. I have no idea if it's working, but I just like seeing it. And that's my attempt at like being really, really overt in perfecting priming. Uh, and the last idea is embracing anchor points. Anchor points is the idea that when we have a conversation with someone and a point comes up, we need a point of reference for it. And whoever can establish the point of reference first gets to win the conversation because they own where that point of reference is on a scale. It's kind of complicated, but it's really not. Have you ever seen an infomercial where something starts at like $100 and you're like, I don't need this blender. But by the end of it, it's like only $19.95 and it got slashed. And you're like, you know, that's not so bad. <laughs> the way that works is they set up an anchor point at $100 and then they whittle themselves down to 20. So you're, you're, when you're looking at the 20, you're comparing it against the anchor point. So when you make a comparison against an anchor point, the gap between where you are and the anchor point is what you establish as value in your own mind. So this is why scholarships work. Scholarships work because high cost equates to high quality, right? And if I think that this degree, well, the degree costs $50,000, but I get half off with my employer, I'm more likely to do it because I think I'm getting a $50,000 degree, when in truth, I'm getting a $25,000 degree because that's how much it costs for me to get it. But in my mind, the anchor point is 50, the cost is 25, the value spread is 25. And that's how anchor points work in our space. Okay, so how about I just give you a whole bunch of tips to actually bring those things to life. So the first one, you need to use real students and not stock photography. I know you're gonna hate me because no one ever has the budget to do this, but I'm telling you, like, it unequivocally outperforms all the time. And so find a way to invest in a test of doing real students and then putting it, because one of the reasons you do real students is so you can slap lower thirds on that and tell their class years because it builds trust because people see themselves in those photos and then they see that other people have already been successful. It's really critical to sell the likelihood and probability of success. And so probability is probably the biggest hurdle that we're trying to clear. And so showing people all the time, the hundreds or thousands of people who have made this purchase and are happy that they did, is a great way to do it. The second thing is to literally show success. Graduation photos, people working, and people with families, are the highest performing images I've ever seen across the two dozen schools that I've worked with. Um, consistently, all the time. And the reason is because we're priming somebody. They're seeing an ad, and it's a happy graduate, or it's a, it's a mom and a family, it's people together, and what we're doing is we're priming them for the emotion they want. Because what they actually want to buy is this moment where the dad and the daughter are together. I want that, that's what I want to buy. I am buying that moment and that is what we're selling. And so showing success is incredibly critical from a visual perspective to show exactly the outcome that somebody wants. Uh, I am just totally personal, subjective, and objective opinion. Uh, is it to me uh, selling on the negative and making somebody feel bad about their life is never gonna convert as well as this kind of stuff does. This stuff just crushes. Making somebody feel positive about who they are and the likelihood that they can better their own lives is exactly where you wanna be. The other one. We want to format your images to fit screens. So here's a super simple tip, but we're trying to interrupt somebody scrolling 300 feet, right? You know, it costs the same amount for a Facebook ad that's horizontal that it does for vertical, but the vertical one fills up your entire phone and the horizontal one fills up a third. If I'm paying the same amount for a CPM, don't I want the full thing? So we switched our Instagram ads from horizontal to vertical, and we literally cut the cost per inquiry in, in half. With one change, it took two hours of work for the team to do. So simplest thing ever is go back and format every image you have for full screen because we said the, our marketing from the whole Inspire Action is almost entirely mobile based. We deliver over 90, 95% of our ads are on mobile. And so the whole thing is I wanna own the entire screen every time. Now when it comes to what you own the screen with, this is the one that most of the academics tend to hate me for saying. You really wanna focus on the most simplistic, visually arresting things that you possibly can. So we shot all these beautiful ads and we talked all about our brand and nobody Nobody gave a crap uh, at all, because why they're on Facebook to see how their friends and family are doing, they're not interested in learning all about us. And so the highest performing ad that we've ever taken out ever is a three second loop of a student waving her hand and it looks like a GIF. Now for those of you that actually do Facebook ads, you know that Facebook doesn't allow GIFs. So all you have to do is loop a video in 30 seconds and put it online and it looks exactly like a GIF to the user and Facebook screeners don't catch it. And then people notice it, why? Because they're on Facebook and they never see a GIF. So they're scrolling and they see a GIF and they're like, that's crazy, I've never seen a GIF before and they stop. And then when they stop, 20%, and literally only 20% of them will ever read this text, but they'll still click through even without it. So the highest performing ad I've ever done in my entire career on Facebook is literally just a GIF of what we call jazz hands, and it's a student going like this. <laughs> so to everybody who's overthinking your ads and debating your copy and worrying about value propositions, like, bad idea. We put out 600 creative variations every single day to try to find these jazz hands, and then we just pump it with our budget. Uh, and so we had you know, 5 million reach, 3,000 inquiries were driven with this one dancing gift alone. Like, this is the world we're in now. This is the elephant, right? We're totally shopping for the elephant right here, and it works. 
The next step to take that a bit further, less is always more. Uh, when I was at Southern New Hampshire University, we did a whole series of campaigns around that bus tour where we drove cross country in a bus, which was super fun. Uh, and we came out with a bunch of commercials, one of which was the client commercial, which I was supportive of too, to be super clear, which was this value prop driven spot where people are like, why did you choose Southern New Hampshire? And they're like, well, let me give you 12 reasons why. And then people just read off all of our value propositions. And we were like, this ad kills. It packed everything in. And then we had this ad where we delivered diplomas to online students, and it didn't say anything about what we did. It literally just said, like, here's who we are, we're this online school, and check out this cool stuff. And like, there's this dad and this son and this wonderful moment. It doesn't say anything about who we are. And when we tested the two with an independent research firm, this one crushed everything we've ever done. So the ad that didn't talk about who we are dramatically outperformed from a brand awareness and a brand affinity perspective. Why? Because TV is for the elephant. TV is not for the rider. So all we're trying to do is get the attention. And so this wonderful emotional moment with a dad and a son was real and genuine, and it broke through the noise, and people noticed it. Then they still need to go to the website, and they still need to learn about who we are, and that's where the rational side of the brain comes in, but we're not there yet. And so that's why when it comes to trying to attract the elephant, less is more. And finally, on that step, just to tell you how far you can take this thing, there's an incredible uh, TED talk uh, on the internet or the universal language of joy from Ingrid uh, Fullerton, I think it is. I, I apologize, I forget her last name. Uh, unbelievable TED talk about how joy is universal. Uh, and there's certain things that are universally intrinsic with joy across cultures ice cream, sprinkles, uh, syrup, puppies, sunsets, uh, roller coasters, like all this like, stuff that like, look, everybody loves. And so like, this is our newest ad campaign. Hey, check it out, it's ice cream, and it's sprinkles, and it's puppies, and it's birthdays, and it's confetti, and it's animals, and it's pools, and it's sunsets, and it's sunsets, and roller coasters, and it's literally syrup, and it's hula hoops. Like, this is what we're selling, and I'm totally okay with it, because this is real students, real people, real moments in their lives, but don't get me wrong, like, we're gonna make sure that what we show actually resonates, and these ads are literally like popping off as far as brand recall, because it feels and looks like things that you like. It makes you feel good and you don't know why. And the reason is because who doesn't like ice cream and sprinkles and puppies and syrup? These are wonderful, warm, positive moments that make us feel good, and then you in unintentionally or subconsciously correlate that to the brand. Okay, but how do we increase interest once they've actually like, okay, we got the elephant, right? The elephant clicked over there on the website, now we gotta really get to work because we gotta really convert them. Okay, so there's a few things you need to do. The first thing you need to do is you need to validate their action. So the elephant clicked, but the rider is now paying attention. So you need to validate what the elephant did so the rider feels good about it. Because what's gonna happen is they're gonna try to make an assessment. They're gonna scan the page really quickly and go, like, should I have clicked this? Like, is this total crap or is this a really good idea? And so what you wanna do is utilize bulleted lists and because people like to check the boxes in their head. So we're accredited, we're nonprofit, we're affordable, 100 programs, online. You're going all the way down the list because that's what they're trying to do. They're trying to literally say, should I have clicked? And that's what you're trying to pay off. So you're reinforcing then the benefits. So you're getting them through that and you're trying to remind them, here's what you get out of it, here's what you get out of it, here's what you get out of it, to try and reinforce, reinforce, reinforce. And all along the way, you're trying to build trust, because it's all about trust. Purchase is always coming down to trust, and it's intrinsic. So what does it actually look like? So here's a landing page. I'm gonna give you away all the best tips that I got. Uh, first one, you always, and I mean always, wanna do a benefit-driven headline. Ours is start sooner, finish faster. Don't put your program name in your headline. Biggest mistake you can make, because what it does is it brings the purchase right to the front. We don't wanna do that. They click, so the first thing you wanna do is remind them all the great stuff they're gonna get. The second thing is you want an action-oriented subhead. So in our case, it's choose from 100 programs. So you wanna remind them, what are they gonna do? Why am I on this page? I'm here to choose. Oh, here's all the stuff I get. Why am I here? I'm gonna choose. Then you wanna do that bulleted value proposition, just pay off all the things in their head that might tell them no. Like, okay, okay, click, 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 good, good, click, 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 good, good. You wanna do a one-step form, not a two-step form. It'll increase your conversion by 30% automatically overnight. You wanna then add your trust indicators and trust factors. These are basically any logo you can slap on there from an accreditor or third-party accolade that looks in any capacity official. This is just to help them validate that, okay, somebody, somebody else thinks they're great, and then you pay it off with a testimonial, which even though they don't know the person, still means something to them. And so these are all the things that we're trying to do. They hit the page, here's your benefit, here's the action I'm asking you to do, here's, all, here's checking all the boxes in your head, reinforce, reinforce, call to action. So that's what we're trying to do. For us at NU, we also decided we're gonna go a step further and we're gonna completely rebuild our entire website. Which if, if you do anything else, I tell you this conference, it's time to rebuild your whole entire website. And I know that's a terrifying thought, but believe me, you should. So when we rebuilt our website, we did a few things. 
Uh, we cut the site load speed in half, which is great. That was just by like building a less cruddy website, which is really good. Uh, we enhanced our security, which increases your rankings. We improved SEO through all the basic stuff. So these are like the housekeeping things you do when you like build a website. I described it to somebody that like building a website is like cleaning out your closet. Like over time, stuff just keeps getting added, and like once in a while, you got to spring clean and take this thing back down to the bones. We added a bunch of trust indicators, which are all those different logos, accolades from all the third parties. We did a focused approach to our value proposition, so every single page on the website has this section called Why Choose National University, and then we just hit them with the big stuff. For us, it's military friendly. We're a veteran-founded nonprofit. We have four-week classes, excuse me, on campus online. You're trying to pay these things off. We also added this great search feature from the home page where someone could type in any program they wanted, take them straight to a program page. The reason is that your home page only has one job, and that's to get somebody to the program page. Because there's only four Ps in the post-traditional marketing space. It's program, price, pace, and probability. Those are the four questions that people have in their minds when they come to your website. Do you have my program? How much does it cost? How fast can I finish? And can I or should I do it? So the first second they get to the home page, you should be measuring how quickly you can get them to a program page. Now, not everyone's ready to get to a program page. And so what you can also do, I highly recommend this, is revamp your program finder experience. You know, do not ask someone to browse based on how you're currently structured. Nobody knows what colleges versus universities versus schools or any of this stuff means. So don't bother with that. So we built a really simplistic three-step program finder, which was literally just asking them, OK, what's your degree level? Associate, bachelor's, master's, doctorate. Uh, what's your area of study, like super broad, like business and IT, healthcare? teaching and education, like real broad buckets, and then do you want to study on campus, online, or both? Three steps, three buttons. If you go on a tablet, these buttons are like absurdly big. Like my grandmother would love this. They're like totally like, she's not gonna miss it. So this alone, this one feature, increased the conversion rate by 64%, and it drove 122% increase in organic traffic. So what happens when you increase the likelihood that somebody finds a page? Google actually tracks when they go from their homepage through your website. And the longer they stay on their destination page before they complete an action, and the less steps they take between it, the higher value Google gives to your website. Because if I can go to your website, and I go to the home page, I find my program, I fill out the form, Google knows they filled out the form because we set up the event in Google Analytics. And so we tell Google, look, that's like a five minute experience, two pages, we crushed it. And Google's like, okay, up in the rankings. But if you go to the page and you can't find it and they click around, Google will punish you for that. And so by making it easier and better for consumers to find the information they want, we can dramatically increase our rankings. Uh, and as a result, we saw a 58% increase in Google search rankings from this one page execution. But we didn't just do that page execution. This is what we ended up with. So this was before, this is after. Uh, we increased website conversion rate 130% um, year over year. Uh, the website project cost us $175,000. Uh, we did it in four months, and it'll drive five to eight million dollars in tuition revenue increase incremental this year. Um, so to, to me, it was a 45x in-year first year return with an in-perpetuity return on that for next year. Uh, and it was a high risk. I mean, we had to ask for $175,000, and we had to tell people that we were going to make it back. But all we pitched was that we would make back $175,000 first year, which I don't know. We didn't even know how. We're like, yeah, it'll, it'll, we'll make it back. And they said, okay. Uh, and thankfully, we re were going to bring back in 45x that investment in the first year. And so, like, for so long in higher ed, to be candid with you, I avoided these conversations because, like, this is the most painful thing to do ever is launching an EDU website. It is, like, so difficult. But, like, if you want to increase conversion and not have to spend a ton of money to do it, this is the behemoth elephant in the room. And so I really highly recommend going for this if you can. So this is all, by the way, everything we talked about is just to get people to inquire. So what do we do once they actually inquire? Well, we have to use a multi-channel outreach, right? We gotta call them, we gotta text them, we gotta email them. We gotta reinforce motivations and obstacles. So the next one, uh, if you're not already, I highly recommend you capturing motivations and obstacles into your CRM. Motivations are why people go back to school. They typically are career enhancement, life enhancement, family benefit, and obstacles are the reasons why they think they may not be successful, which, believe it or not, you should ask them on the first phone call. So they'll say, I'm not sure I can afford it, I'm not sure I can juggle it with work. So you want to track your motivation and your obstacles in the conversation, and then you want to be persistent and you want to make it personal. And with that, I'm going to give away all the best stuff that we've done. So this is called an app light. An app light is what the consumer thinks is your application. So I don't know about you all, but the application process at most of our schools is like so incredibly painful. And so we can get people to inquire, but it is really hard to get them to fill out the application. And so here's what you do. You get people to think they filled out the application, and then you do the rest of it for them. And so what we created was what's called an app light. I'll give full credit to the folks at Southern Hampshire University. I saw that as the first time ever in 2012 there, a variation of this concept. So if someone fills out their RFI, they don't get taken to a thank you page. Instead, they fill out the RFI, they get taken to this page that says, want to expedite the admissions process? 
Who doesn't want to do that, right? <laughs> Benefit-driven headline. And it says, just fill out this brief application and we'll put you to the front of the queue. I don't know what that means, but it sounds good. And it is true, we'll call you right away. And so what happens is you have all these extra fields that you fill out, but it's only like eight fields. This isn't that bad because we pre-populated it. You click it and it says, thanks for applying. And you get a whole thank you message reinforcing that you applied. Then we call you and get you on the phone. And during that first phone call, we ask you all those really tough, where else did you go to school? How much? And we ask all the information and we fill it out for you because why would we make it difficult for somebody else? And so then we send them an email and just say, you want to verify this is your full application? And it's like totally painless. 50% of people that get served this up fill it out in the first session. It increases inquiry to admit rate by 25%. One web page, one change, 25% increase in first year revenue. All because we made it really easy, right? We're not doing anything gross or weird here. I know it feels odd sometimes to talk about this, but like we're literally making this better and easier for people so they can evaluate the decision for themselves. We're not tricking them. We're not giving them false information. We're just making stuff feel less like the DMV. <laughs> so the next step to this, you need to personalize your emails. So all those beautiful emails that your creative teams have designed, throw them away and never use them. So what we do instead is we only send plain text emails. And I know that sounds terrifying, but all the emails that we send are plain text and they always have your first name in it. Hi, first name, quick question. Because why? We are marketing to the elephant. Because the elephant is the person in us that goes through your email and just swipes on all that spam and delete, delete, delete. So the only thing we care about is getting you to open it. You open it if you think a real person wrote it. But if you just see that subject line and then you open it and it's some spam email, you're like, ah, they got me. So instead you open it and you have a personal email. Now this is automated, it's machine learning and that's fine. And it just says, you know, dear Seth, I was looking through my files and I saw that you recently inquired but never filled out an application. I wanted to follow up to see how my team did. Did we reach out effectively? Do you have any questions? Let me know how I can help. And it comes from the head of enrollment. We get thousands of responses to this every quarter, and then we just triage them. The person literally just forwards them off to their team, and they say, oh, thanks so much. You know, Brandon forwarded me your email, wanted me to reach out. He said you had some questions. We're literally just facilitating the contact with enrollment, but making it feel more human. And it dramatically works. Our email open rates went from 18%. They're consistently 30 to 40% all the time. We've had email open rates up to 60%, and uh, my fun one is the highest performing subject line of all time at like 60% was Happy Thanksgiving, first name. Um, so for whatever it's worth, that totally works, and this campaign pushes over 500 applications every single month. Uh, so personalize your emails, plain text, uh, and just be human. It is going to work for you. Uh, and then finally, I would just encourage you as you think through these things to, to utilize something called messaging hierarchy. Messaging hierarchy is the idea that you're not looking to deliver the same message all the way through the decision-making process, but you're looking to, ev to evolve your message based on where people are. So this is really simplistic, but it's like here's awareness, trying to make someone know who we are. Interest is like our website, landing pages, they're thinking about us. Conversion is how we follow up with them once enrollment's reaching out. Then once they're a student and they're a graduate. It outlines what are the goals of each of these stages, and then we literally take our value propositions and we say which ones are we gonna talk about where. And this works because how many of us have had clients or partners or administrators or wonderful colleagues that tell us that we have to talk about something upfront that we all know nobody cares about? The thing is you should never say no, you should always say yes but. And the answer is yes but, here's where it fits in the hierarchy, way down here in the website. But you wanna find a home for everything. Because the problem is when we get bullied into putting things in that awareness stage, we're not gonna be able to inspire action. And so messaging hierarchy is one of the best things that you can do. I do wanna take a second and talk about why we recommend. So those are some ways that you can help people convert. But it's important to understand that once we do, we actually have to deliver on the promise. Which is we have to like actually provide value and deliver a really great experience. Now this, I only have a couple examples because I'll be super candid. In my career, I have been and, and hope to not, but probably will remain a sales guy. Like this is, I'm upper funnel and that's where I live. But marketing is everything. Marketing is the full experience all the way through. And I hope that all of you uh, carry the same torch that I do, which is every day I try to fight my way down the funnel with one project or another to be more student facing and more student engaging and doing more with alumni. And so it's critical because as John O'Shaughnessy says, who's just the godfather of this stuff, brand loyalty is always conditional. No one is ever with you for life. They're always just one uh, step away from dropping you. Uh, it's important for us to ask, how do we deliver on the promise? And so from the marketing perspective, I would just say that the thing that I have found success in in my last two jobs is just leveraging net promoter score. Um, you, marketing has a right to own net promoter score and talk about the fact of like how likely are people to recommend us. And that to me is a great way to wedge our foot into the fuller experience of like, where are people saying that like they're struggling with financial aid, or they're having a really bad time with something online. So leverage net promoter score as a way to insert yourself into conversations that we may not normally be invited to. And then the second thing would be, how do we increase word of mouth? 
And the concept here that I would share uh, is a really simple one, which is that we should all think about ways that we can incentivize social sharing. So people are far more likely to be successful with something if they share it on social media. So we want people to talk about them go themselves going back to school, not just for our benefit, but also for theirs. They're more likely to be successful if they tell people that they're going back to school. So when I was at Southern New Hampshire University, we launched this really fun project where if you made Dean's List, you got this link, it created a custom page on our website, it took a day and a half to build, and then it got your, you know, okay, Kevin so-and-so made Dean's List, congratulations, and they could click it and they could share it with their friends. It was a simple way to like, if somebody's getting an A or if someone's graduating or doing something, like they want to share it and they want to brag. We're all looking for permission to brag, right? So find ways to give that, and that's a great thing that marketing can do. So finally, how do we bring all this together to provide some value? So I have a couple uh, thoughts to share with you. Uh, these are my 10 things to remember, and I'm gonna give you the five tactical tips on exactly what I recommend that you do uh, when you leave. So the 10 things that you should do. First, we need to know what everyone's buying. So what's everybody buying? They're buying, buying improved quality of life. So then we need to sell what they're buying. We are selling improved quality of life. That is what we sell in marketing, and we deliver it through degrees, which delivers career advancement, but ultimately we're, we're delivering satisfaction, admiration, the sense of belonging, being seen and being heard. We're addressing the basics of human need. Third, we're making it easier. I hope when you saw through all the things that I was doing, we're making it easier and easier and easier. When you make something painful, the elephant stops being in charge and the rider takes over. And the rider says, hold on a second, you really sure you can go back to school? You got a lot going on with work right now and people talk themselves out of it. The majority of adult students that don't follow through with an inquiry to one of our institutions don't go somewhere else. The majority of students don't persist at all, which means that what's happening is they're stopping themselves from doing this. And if we truly believe that they can do this, then that, that's a disservice to them and a disservice to us. Make it personal. In all cases, personal works. One, it makes people feel better. And two, it lets the elephant drive a little bit and it helps get through that noise. Third is you need to align with their motivations. What do people really want? You need to overcome their obstacles, it's super critical. And they need to relentlessly test new tactics. The things that I shared with you today, just a few, you know, increasing conversion rates 130%, doubling email open rates. I have like a bucket of things that didn't work behind that for every one of those. Um, so like relentlessly test and try things as much as you possibly can. If your strategy today is what your strategy was yesterday, you have to ask why, because you knew less yesterday than you do today. So as you gain more information, you should always be challenging yourself and your strategies. Uh, you need to reinforce decisions along the way. Constantly reinforce and make people feel positive about stuff. Really, really critical. It costs 89 cents to drop a letter into someone's mailbox from the dean of the school they got accepted to, saying congratulations and welcome to the family. 89 cents. When your cost per acquisition is anywhere from $2,000 to $4,000, that's a pretty decent investment. You need to also focus full funnel. We're never allowed to do that in marketing, but like, come on with me, right? Someday we'll own the whole experience. We're trying. Uh, and then finally, like, be human. I know sometimes like it's, it feels a little like funky to talk about all this stuff, but like just be real, be positive, provide people value, and it'll pay off. So if you want to do these things, here's the five ways to get started in the exact order I recommend it. So the first one is literally go home and secret shop your organization. And secret shop it like a whole bunch, not once, not twice, like three, four, five times. And like set up your own emails on Google, set up your own Google Voice phone number so they can call your phone and they don't realize that it's you. And like go through the experience, like actually answer the calls and like go all the way through up until financial aid. Like really walk through this and get it. Because what you're gonna do is you're gonna map the customer journey. This is like the most important thing. So you get marketing and enrollment together and you map the customer journey. You say, okay, what is it like from very top of the funnel, awareness, all the way through, they hit the websites, they inquire, and you map the whole process all the way down. And then what you're gonna do is identify opportunities for testing. And every opportunity you test can only ever test one thing. And that's the conversion rate between two status steps and the status stages for enrollment. So it shouldn't just be like, we should test this tactic or that tactic. You should always say, we are testing to increase what? The goal is always, the objective is always to increase the rate between two status steps. Meaning this test is to increase inquiry delivered to successful contact or contact to transfer. Or this is to, to get transfer to app submitted. Like you have to get really specific. So you could map out the customer journey, get a piece of paper, put it around the room, one for each status step, write down all the ideas you can think of, and then you t-shirt size them. I learned this from a brilliant guy, John Doberton, way smarter than me, um, and he taught me this exercise, it's super simple. So you sit around the table with everybody from marketing enrollment, you take like half a day, and you have a whole room full of status stages, and you have like 50 ideas on the wall, things you wanna do. And then you ask everybody to say, okay, back of the napkin, what's the input? Like how much work is it gonna take to do this? Small, medium, large, extra large. And then you just say, okay, what's the potential output for tuition revenue? Like the impact on the bottom line budget, small, medium, large, and extra large. And then you just sort by the small stuff, and you just start with all the small stuff that delivers large or extra large results first. 
and it's super simple, and that's how you align. And when you do that, it means you can launch stuff that within like two weeks starts driving more revenue, and then you start sharing that, and then you get real runway, because people are reason that what you're doing is you're really driving tuition money. And tuition money is what's driving the budget, which is how you're gonna be able to do more with less, which how you're gonna be able to hit this year's budget with last year's spend, even though this year's revenue is a higher goal. So that is like exactly what you do for the five steps. So map your customer journey, identify the opportunities, t-shirt size the inputs and the outputs, do all the easy shit that pays well first, and then work your way to the hard stuff, which is why we didn't get to the website for NU for like 14 months, because we did all the easy stuff first. So we did the easy stuff, and then we're like, okay, fine, we'll do the big heavy stuff. So all that said, I wanna be honest. Sometimes when I talk about this stuff, I've never talked about this specific topic or this length, uh, it feels kind of weird and it feels kind of funky and almost a little bit gross because uh, I don't want to be a salesman. Like I'm proud of what we do. Like my grandfather was a college president. My mother taught adults in community college and junior college at night. I spent my summers like in class with her, uh, literally in the back coloring. Uh, my grandmother built one of the first adult academic advising divisions in the 1980s it's, 80s at Sage Junior College. Like, like I got a family that I got to like live up to and be proud of. And I'm trying to contribute in some capacity to like the impact that they have all had. And so sometimes when I talk about this stuff, it feels a little bit weird. So I really want you to think about a couple thoughts. I'm gonna hit the last one first, and then I'm gonna go back to the next one. And it's this. If we truly believe we are great at what we do, it is our responsibility to ensure people know we're an option. This is how I sleep at night. And this is what I tell myself, is that if I honestly believe that we're good at what we do, and there are other people in this space who are not as good, there are other people who cost more and are not gonna deliver, then I have a social responsibility to do all the stuff I talked about today and worry about the elephant and worry about the rider and worry about priming and anchor points because the more students that come over aren't tuition revenue and it's not numbers in an Excel sheet. These are human beings who are benefiting from what we do. You know, we don't sell vacuums. Now there's anything wrong with the vacuums. My dad loves vacuums, but we don't sell vacuums. We're in the education industry and education is transformational. My grandfather always told me that education was the great equalizer. And so I tell myself this when we talk about conversion because I think sometimes people dismiss this stuff as like dirty or weird and the truth is this stuff works. And right now, not all of us get to win. And so the people that get to win are gonna be the ones that market smarter. And so this is what I tell myself. If you wanna learn more about it, these are just like my top six books in this space. Uh, John O'Shaughnessy's book is like amazing but hard to find. And then I'm probably sure a lot of you read Blink uh, by Malcolm Gladwell, uh, Thinking Fast and Slow, Switch, Brain Influence, Mesh Methods of Persuasion. These are all like great books on neuroscience and marketing and trying to just get into the psychology of sales. And so, you know, my hope today is both to give you some tips, tricks, practical stuff that you can take away to increase conversion, but more importantly, to hopefully get you all to like think about what we do in a big picture way. Step back and ask why. Uh, so often our strategies are quite literally like what we did last quarter, uh, and we have a chance to kind of shake that up. Um, I've been very lucky to work with an incredibly talented team who are like the ones who did all the great work that I get to talk about, uh, and they're, they're wildly successful and talented folks. Um, but we did it because we made some big moves and tried some big things, and we, we missed a lot, um, and that's okay. But we also had some cool wins. Increasing conversion 130% year over year is like awesome, and email over to in the 30s is like totally great, and getting to like make ads with like Ice cream and sprinkles is cool. Uh, so it's, it's, not, it's not all weird and gross, it's fun stuff. Uh, and with that, I will say thank you and, I, and I'm happy to answer your questions if you have, but otherwise I just appreciate your time and attention tonight.